It's a pleasure to introduce today Professor David Armstrong, a Chalice Professor of Philosophy at Sydney University, who is an external examiner from 1984 to 1986. Can I ask you straight away, uh, David, did you begin your professional life as a, as a philosopher, or do you have some uh, other background before you got into philosophy? No, uh, I went as an undergraduate uh, to Sydney University in uh, 1947, and uh, as soon as I found that I was good at philosophy, I uh, didn't want to do anything else. And I was interested at, in the subject even when I was a schoolboy, though uh, looking back I don't think I understood it. So I was very pleased to uh, uh, do it right from the beginning. What persuaded you that you were good at it? Uh, oh, coming top of second year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> You, you've been, been writing on the subject for, for many years now, um, from the, the late 1950s, in fact. And your early work was on, on perception and, and bodily sensation. There's a book called uh, Perception and the External World. In perception and the Physical World. The physical World, sorry, and Bodily sen Sensation, 1961 and 1962. Um, can I begin by asking you perhaps a specific question in that sort of area. People have found a dualist theories of perception attractive, <coughs> I guess mainly because of the phenomenon, the reality of, of mental images. Yes. And they seem to be mental images, we seem to be able to contrive them, turn them around in our heads, and it seems almost natural to um, accept a picture of an inner eye, as it were, gazing in on these, uh, on these mental images. Now, I've no doubt that that position won't stand up to scrutiny, yes. but does a materialist position of the sort that you favour um, offer any way of squaring with these facts about mental imagery that uh, seem so, so vivid? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I found it a great uh, struggle to come to the views that uh, I came to uh, for years, I thought that the representative theory of perception was uh, very attractive. John Anderson, my teacher at Sydney University, persuaded me that uh, it couldn't be true that if uh, all you perceived were your own sensations or sense impressions or something like that, then there'd be insoluble problems uh, about uh, your knowledge of the external world. I'm not quite sure now how strong those arguments were, but they persuaded me at the time. So I thought one needed some direct realist theory of perception, where one said had some quite direct apprehension of reality, and uh, I wanted a theory which would uh, do that. And I do agree that uh, for that theory to be complete, it ought to explain why it is so attractive to say that in perception we gaze at sense data and that when we have mental images we gaze at a little inner image. And uh, I'm not absolutely sure whether uh, uh, I have a uh, theory which can show why the opposition view is so attractive. Yeah, not so much why the opposition view is so attractive, um, although I think that is a, a question to, uh, to be concerned about. Um, but can a materialist view offer a reasonable alternative account of the, of the phenomenon? And it, presumably in the area of uh, perception, um, the, the hard facts that we've got to go on are phenomena like uh, mental imagery that any, any theory must uh, take account of. Um, yes. I think you would say it has as a compulsory question. That's the, one of your favorite phrases. Now, this seems to be a compulsory question for, for materialism to account for the phenomenon of mental imagery. Yes, yes. Uh, when I started all, uh, on all this, uh, I wasn't so interested in the question of materialism, uh, uh, but uh, rather uh, direct realism. And I think direct realism is a, a separate issue from uh, uh, materialism. You could do 
a dualist and still think that you are in direct touch in perception with the external world and still think that the idea that uh, there were sense data and things called mental images, you could still think that was a bad idea, even though you're a dualist. So I think we need to sort out issues a bit here. Mm. Uh, direct realism and the theory of perception is one thing, and uh, whether one goes on to be a materialist is another matter. Right. Yeah. Well, wouldn't then, um, um, wouldn't then the, the view that we're, that we're, um, wouldn't the phenomenon that we're concerned with uh, be suitably put like, like this? that we um, seem to be in direct touch with the internal world, the world of, of, of images. Yes. And what, what accounts for um, what accounts for our feeling of that way? Well, that's uh, very uncertain. Uh, in another way, uh, it's an extraordinary idea that, it's, that we're not in direct touch with the world really an extraordinary idea, unless a little philosophical reflection supervenes, that I'm not directly looking at your face, mm. at least. Well, I don't know if it's, a, if it's an answer to, <coughs> to one philosophical idiosyncrasy to, to cite another. <laughs> you know, I, share with, uh, I, I share your direct realism, it seems eminently sensible to, say, to me to say that we are in direct contact with um, but it's a natural thing to say too. Yeah, but I'm saying it's not a natural thing to say when we're concerned with imagery, to say that we're directly in touch with with pictures, shapes, and things inside our head. I mean, what what other alternative is there? Well, philosophy is criticism, isn't it? And. Uh, it's a matter of bringing fundamental beliefs together mm. and seeing how they fit together. And uh, it doesn't look as though all our fundamental intuitions or all the things we're naturally led to say are going to be uh, all naturally for... We're not going to get a theory which will naturally save them all. Mm. And so it's a question of doing the best we can, saving as much as we can, uh, chucking out as few people out of the lifeboat as possible. Uh, and uh, we can give some account of mental imagery, I think, though it's not easy. We can say, well, what goes on in you when you have a mental image is like what goes on in you. This is a very familiar phrase to you, of course, from uh, Smart's uh, views. It's like what goes on in you uh, when you perceive. And uh, presumably, when we're, as we say, aware of a train of images passing through our mind, we're aware of the processes are going on in our mind, like perception. And one of the tasks, I don't know that philosophers have carried it very far in this particular case, would be to say, well, in just what way like, and in just mm. what way unlike. Mm. You see, it does seem to me one thing to describe what it's like, and another to, to say what it is, if I can put it uh, kind of crudely. Um, perhaps, but perhaps well, that, that's all that we can say. Perhaps all we can say is there's something going on like. Mm. And this, of course, does lead us a bit nearer materialism, mm. because then there's the question what this something in fact is. And, uh, of course, as, as you know, I think that what that something is is uh, a brain process. Mm. Oh, it's good we should be so naturally led to questions of materialism because my next question was, the, the one I had in mind was about uh, materialism. Uh, first, a, a kind of historical question. Why do you think it was that materialism, which seems such a good scientific bet, emerged so late <coughs> you know, in, in Australia in the late 1950s? I don't really think it emerged in Australia in the 1950s. I think that's just uh, a bit of a joke. People used to talk about uh, Australian materialism, and uh, I tell my students that uh, modern materialism was invented in Adelaide, and was invented by Jack Smart and UT Place, mm. and uh, they were a couple of Englishmen, and therefore the theory is known as Australian materialism. But that's all a bit of a joke. I think that we materialists uh, uh, for a 
the way back uh, before smart and place. But what's true, I think, what has to be explained and is not so easy to explain is why the main tradition of philosophy since Descartes onwards uh, has been anti-materialist and materialism has only got a, a big run on in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. I think that does need explaining. My own view is why this has happened is this. Uh, it, it's Descartes dualism. It's Cartesian dualism. You have there a very sophisticated theory of the external world, of the physical world, and then you've got a declaration that the mind is completely different. Everything mental is swept away into another realm. And uh, the question for subsequent Western philosophy has been which side of this dualism are we going to take seriously? It isn't easy to rest with a dualism. Maybe in the end dualism is true, but uh, people think, uh, well, it'd be nice if we could have a unified and monistic theory. And uh, in a way, um, if you just looked at Descartes' theory, you might think the materialism was going to win. He had a, a very sophisticated and interesting theory which swept away a lot of medieval and Aristotelian theorizing. He had a purely mechanical theory of the body, a plausible theory, uh, uh, and in fact he pointed the way for subsequent physiology, and uh, you, you could see him in a way as one of the uh, authors of modern biology. So why didn't it go on? And uh, uh, in the philosophical tradition and uh, engulf the mind. Mm. That didn't happen. And I think the reason must be uh, Descartes' epistemology, which was quite different from his uh, metaphysics, mm. uh, from his uh, uh, theory of the external world. Uh, for him, epistemology started with uh, knowledge of his own mind, as it were, with mind here and body here, epistemologically, Descartes started over here, locked up in his own mind, the cogito, and the only thing he could be sure of were his own mental states. And for some reason, that was it, it was this epistemological mind that uh, trapped the subsequent tradition. They thought, well, we know about the mind, and... Uh, uh, it exists all right, but does the physical world exist? And that, of course, led people to say, well, perhaps there is no physical world, or at any rate, we can analyze the physical world in terms of the mind. You have Berkeley trying to analyze matter in terms of ideas, and at a later, more sophisticated level, you have uh, uh, the absolute idealists, Hegel and uh, the others, uh, claiming that uh, what was out there was really mental, and so it was not foreign to mind and could be known by the mind. And uh, I think, in a way, the last two or three centuries have uh, we've been spending an awful lot of time trying to get around, uh, get away from Descartes' uh, bad epistemology. But are you really saying that that, <coughs> that Descartes was the original troublemaker, as it were. It seems to me that um, dual, you find dualism in, uh, pretty clearly in Socrates and in the Greeks, and, and also, perhaps because of uh, the problem of, of free will, it's the, the view that, uh, that laymen, uh, untutored uh, laymen, uh, would naturally espouse. Yes, there must be something in what you're saying. It would be absurd to think that Descartes was somehow responsible. Mm. Uh, but I choose him. He became the representative figure. Mm. Uh, why people swung behind him and thought, the Cartesian dilemma, here I am, certain of my own mind, but locked up in it, and can I really know that there's anything beyond? Uh, why people went for this view, I don't know. I mean, 
you could have all, all sorts of theory. If you were a Marxist, you might say it had something to do with the rise of bourgeois individualism mm -hmm. and the breakup of the medieval structures. That's not a, a completely implausible view. It, it might have uh, it might have something to be said for it. But at any rate, all I say is the breakout marked the point at which our Western philosophy went into this long epistemological mm. mode in which it found certainty within the self and wondered whether it could get out. And that's why I think materialism uh, took so long to emerge. Mm. But you can see modern materialism, modern philosophical materialism, as I think finally the revenge of Descartes' uh, theory of the external world on his theory of mind. I guess the book for which you're, you're still best known, uh, David, is um, A Materialist Theory of Mind, written in, in 1968. And um, probably um, what's best known about that work is uh, the fact that in it you inaugurate if that's the word, uh, functionalism, a view that's uh, probably most widely held now among, uh, among philosophers of mind in general. Um, but there has uh, crystallized in, in recent years what perhaps is the central objection to, uh, to, to functionalism, the objection that concerns qualia, the felt quality of things. Um, there's a, a succinct formulation of this objection in Searle's recent book, Intentionality. Perhaps I can read out um, the, the quotation. He says, No one ever considered his own terrible pain or his deepest worry and concluded that they were just Turing machine states or that they could be defined in terms of their causes and effects. What's the functionalist's answer to, um, to the, the Qualia objection? Do you have a a neat knockdown argument. Well, I don't want to answer for the functionalist first, Lawrence, because I don't think really my theory is a functionalist theory, but as a causal theory. Maybe that's not a very important distinction, but it's a distinction that I value. I think I, I think of myself as putting forward a causal theory of mind. Functionalism seems to be a bit wider than the notion of causality. But anyway, moving on from that to the question of qualia, I think that uh, here the question of direct realism becomes very important. And that uh, if one is a direct realist, uh, the problem about qualia becomes a good deal easier. Uh, Think in particular about the case of color, which seems to me to be the case where qualities are most vividly and obviously present. And I mean, the worries about quality are often uh, uh, encapsulated in questions like, uh, could it be that when things are looking red to me, they're looking green to you? things like that. Could it be that you and I have inverted spectrums? Uh, well now, uh, and here you think, well, maybe one person's having quite different qualities to another. Uh, but if you think of these qualities as qualities of the object, if you think of colors as simply qualities of the object, mm which I then, as a physicalist, would go on to reduce to purely physical properties, the sort of properties that physicists would be happy with. Uh, if you think of them in that way, it isn't so obvious, it seems to me, that there are internal qualities to be experienced. There are experiences, but there are experiences of things with qualities. And I think that holds even for bodily sensations. I think that uh, the qualitative aspect of bodily sensations is really something we associate with uh, 
bodily places. Mm. If you have a pain in your hand, then uh, if the quality is anywhere, it's in your hand. Yeah. And uh, your hand is in a special state, has a special quality. And then, having uh, put forward that sort of view, I then go on to argue that there's no reason why this special quality uh, shouldn't be identified with some purely physiological state of your hand. Well, what about the, the feeling of, of uh, acute worry then? It doesn't seem to be localizable like that. Yes, emotions are, emotions are more difficult. And it is possible that we shall have to allow a range of internal qualities. I'm inclined to think not. It's not so obvious to me. I don't know what you think. It's not so obvious to me that there are qualities associated with emotional states. But if there are, well, introspection, I take to be a physical process. When we turn in and examine our own experience, I take it that we are uh, scanning our own mind. And if materialism is true, that's going to be a matter of uh, one set of brain processes, scanning other brain processes. And why shouldn't we pick up, perhaps in introspection, certain peculiar qualities, which, if we're physicalists, we can then go on further and identify with a purely physical state. Well, I guess the, the answer would be that you don't, <coughs> you don't so much observe them or scan them as feel them. <coughs> I take that to be the, the point that Searle is actually making. Yes, I'm not sure what feel means here. If feel is used as a perceptual verb, and it often is, uh, then presumably you want to distinguish between uh, the perception and the thing felt. And uh, <coughs> the thing felt, it's the thing that's felt that has the qualities. Mm. And uh, if, for instance, uh, there are qualities associated with emotions, then it's in being aware of those emotions that one's aware of those qualities. This awareness is a sort of introspection, mm. or is introspection, and it would be an awareness of a certain internal state which tends to cause, apt for causing certain sorts of behaviors, uh, which has certain peculiar qualities which we apprehend. And then there would be the further question whether you could go on and identify these qualities with physical states. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> well, I've been trying to to uh, keep this interview orderly by proceeding in a strictly chronological manner, using uh, as guides the, the books that you've written along the way. So perhaps now I could come to a book you wrote in 1973 called Belief, Truth, and, uh, and Knowledge. I've got just one question um, about that, that material, one that uh, you don't confront in your book, and it's this. You offer in that book a correspondence account of, of truth, and yet um, Tarski, in his uh, famous uh, paper of the 1930s, argued that one couldn't achieve a correspondence theory of truth for natural languages uh, because of the of the liar paradox. Um, now, what do you say is the truth value of a statement like what I'm now saying is not true? Um, I haven't got any very worked out position on this, but uh, I'm inclined to say that what the arguments uh, show is that that's not really a statement. Uh, I take it that uh, the uh, class of all classes paradox, mm. for instance, shows that uh, there is no such class. That, uh, as Reinhard Grossman has argued in uh, recent work, or I think he's been arguing for some years, uh, the paradoxes are really non-existence proofs. 
they show that contrary to some intuitions we might have had that uh, these things don't really exist uh, that there is no real sentence uh, uh, the sentence written on this page is false uh, there's an inscription but there isn't really a sentence in the full uh, uh, in the full sense. Do you have any account, or a partial account anyway, of what constitutes a sentence in the full sense? Because I, I presume that if one's given a, a, a theory of uh, belief and knowledge and truth, um, one needs to say quite a bit about what are the tr truth bearers. Um, what are propositions, what can be believed and known, for example? Yes, uh, you, you've, to some extent you've been luring me on ground which I know nothing about and therefore just Deliberate. exposing, <laughs> yes I'm sure, exposing my general ignorance. Uh, but uh, as to propositions, uh, you see I don't really think that uh, they exist. Uh, they are structured states within our mind, which I would identify with beliefs, uh, and uh, talking about propositions is um, talking about um, the way these structured states point to the world in certain ways, but I don't think uh, there actually is something called a proposition which uh, exists independently of the structured states. Uh, if you like, put it this way, there are beliefs mm -hmm. and they are structured states of the mind and thus according to me structured states of the central nervous system uh, but they are not things believed in addition mm -hmm. though we can usefully talk about what it is that we believe. You and I might be said to believe the same thing or not believe the same thing, but I don't really think that that means that uh, uh, you're, you suppose you and I both have the same false belief. Mm. There's a structured state within us, but I don't think that there is something else, a proposition, uh, which is the object of both these structured states. That's the sort of uh, uh, metaphysics that I want to get away from, uh, uh, which I think any materialist and naturalist will want to get away from. Well, I'm a little surprised to, to hear you say this because um, you rightly, to my mind, uh, criticize uh, modern usage of the term abstract entity um, as something kind of uh, ethereal, and of course um, neither of us would want to say that a proposition is a ethereal entity, and you point out that um, we should use the word abstract in the sense of something being abstracted. Now, <coughs> what would be wrong from your point of view with saying that the notion of a proposition or that a proposition is abstracted from a sentence by uh, ignoring, if you like, the, the physical features of the ins inscription and concentrating on or attending to just what is said in the uh, uh, inscribing of the inscription or the action of the sentence. The idea is that uh, we should think of the uh, uh, proposition as some very complex, no doubt, relational property mm. of the uh, belief state. Is that right? Perhaps, yeah. Yes, well, perhaps that would be all right. I haven't uh, thought this out at all, though, but uh, I agree that seems quite an attractive line to take. Mm. Well, <coughs> we've almost imperceptibly moved on to other concerns of yours, concerns that have been, that, that you've written about in, in your book on scientific realism, theory of universals. Um, can I begin talking about that? by uh, putting my question in this way. Um, science tells us that for all its wonderful diversity, the world actually consists only of some hundred or so distinct elements. Um, now, do you, as a realist, uh, claim that the world also consists of a group, perhaps a, a fairly small group, of properties and relations? 
And here are these properties and relations related to these elements that scientists tell us exist. Uh, well, I suppose that these elements, you're thinking of things like electrons or atoms or mm. quarks or mm. something like that. Uh, I suppose them to be uh, particulars having various properties, the sort of properties that uh, science uh, tells us about, and standing in all sorts of complex relations to each other. This, if you like, is a more abstract account of them than the scientist will give. Uh, the scientist is concerned with their particular nature, mm. and uh, but uh, reflecting on this, it seems to me to be a good high-level general theory that what he's doing is discovering that there are particulars with all sorts of properties where these properties are repeatable things where for instance two different electrons can have the very same property charge say mm. and where uh, different groups of things can all be related to each other by the very same relation. A and B may be, may be related by a certain relation, uh, precedes or something like that, and C and D may be related by exactly the same relation, precedes. And so we'd have a very general picture of the world. Uh, it's to be found, for instance, in uh, Russell's Principia, Ma Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, as the world, as a world of particulars, having properties which are repeatable, they are universals in technical terminology, and uh, related to each other. Uh, this strikes me as quite a good world hypothesis. It's very, very abstract, of course, mm -hmm. but. Uh, well, that's what philosophers do. It's, uh, it's, it's the realist gloss uh, that you're putting on all of this that I, I want to ask about, because presumably a scientist could say, yes, um, electrons uh, spin, and two electrons may spin at the same rate. Um, but we're already treading on distinctively philosophical territory if we say that electrons have spin, or there's some property that these two electrons share. Yes. Um, now, you, you want to say that these properties are part of the, the furniture of the world. Yes. Um, so, aren't you claiming something more uh, than the, the scientist who says literally everything that there is are the hundreds or so elements and uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, perhaps we can, we can talk, uh, as you wanted to talk just before, of the, of the subatomic particles that there are. Yes. So you want, you want, you're making a, an ontological claim. You're saying there's something over and above um, what, what the scientists would, would uh, so exist. I don't believe so, because uh, in my understanding, it's up to the scientists to tell us what are the fundamental properties and the fundamental relations. This is why I call my realism about universals and our posteriori realism. It's to be decided not by philosophers sitting in armchairs or uh, sitting in chairs like we're sitting, uh, but uh, by experimental, ultimately by experimental physics and uh, experimental science. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this year, <coughs> our student society journal is devoted to the question of God's existence, just to change the subject a little. Um, does the strong form of naturalism that you espouse rule out the possibility of God? Uh, yes, I, I think it does. Uh, my naturalism uh, is the view that uh, the world is a spatio-temporal system, and uh, this is all there is to the world. And uh, that, if that is true, uh, then uh, uh, presumably uh, uh, we uh, don't need the further hypothesis of a creator uh, or and or sustainer of this world. Mm -hmm. Well, there are 
answers to that, but I'm not going to, to try to, to provide any in this short interview. Um, perhaps I, I can move on to um, your recent book on the laws of nature. Um, you argue that there are such laws, laws which support counterfactuals, um, and you argue that induction is rational, um, even though you admit to having no answer to Hume's uh, skepticism about induction. But supposing I, I say this, if we look backwards in time, as it were, um, there was a time, only the, the first uh, day when the universe came into existence, when things were very different. There was a, a big bang, and regularities followed that. Now, why shouldn't we say, um, by a, a parallel kind of argument, the things might be very different in the, the future. Why is it rational to suppose uh, that things will continue to be much as the same, to, to put the uh, inductivist uh, point crudely? Uh, well, uh, first, it, it's not clear to me that I'd admit that uh, uh, there's no answer to Hume. It seems to me that uh, it's quite... Uh, this, uh, it's quite a promising idea that Hume can be answered. Sorry, I, I thought in a paper that you read to us a, a couple of days ago um, that, you, that your argument was um, that because uh, Hume's conclusion uh, led to an absurdity, then our best bet was to reject Hume's uh, conclusion and, and wait till we, uh, till we find some, some answer to, to Hume. I didn't think that you had an answer at your fingertips. Oh, it? no, I think also that oh, uh, we can answer mm. Hume. Uh, but even if we couldn't, mm. I think it would be so ridiculous, the idea that we cannot learn from observation and experience, mm. and that this cannot give us good reason to expect uh, uh, the, the same sort of things to happen in the future, assuming we have the same circumstances. Of course, if circumstances change utterly, perhaps, uh, uh, things would be different, but uh, given that we have the same sort of situations cropping up again, I think it would be the height of irrationality uh, to think that experience had not given us any guide to what was going to happen. In fact, we do all think of experience as the guide of life, though we agree that it only gives us a probable guide. Uh, well, that's common sense, and Hume has a very sophisticated philosopher's argument to yeah. show that that's no good. Uh, as between such fundamental common sense and a philosopher's argument, I'd go for the common sense e any day. But it so happens that I also think that uh, there are promising lines of thought uh, which can answer Hume. Yeah. But you, you did say maybe half an hour ago that you also thought that common sense was often unreliable. That some, sometimes things turn out quite contrary to, to common sense, but you, you don't regard it as even a remote possibility that in this area uh, um, our common sense view is, is wrong. I would have thought that our belief that induction in some broad sense, mm -hmm. no doubt we haven't got a very good grip on the detailed nature of induction, but I would think the idea that we can learn from experience, and in science we do learn from experience, and in ordinary experience of life we, that we learn from experience, that that is so fundamental that I don't really see how one, uh, uh, how a philosopher could be justified in giving that up. Okay. Um, science and philosophy, as you see it, are engaged in um, a collaborative enterprise, um, although the, you insist that there's a, a division of labor, we shouldn't yes. tread on each other's professional toes, as it were. Um, now, presumably, if labor is divided, um, there needs to be some assembling of uh, the, the, the efforts of, of the various groups of workers. Yes. Um, do you have any evidence of scientists making use of, of our results, or more pointedly, of making use of your results? No, not particularly. I, uh, uh, <coughs> scientists, 
with the exception apparently of the very greatest scientists mm. don't seem to be very interested in philosophy and uh, I don't particularly blame them. Um, philosophy is attempting to get a very general view of things indeed and some of the problems that philosophers deal with are so general that uh, uh, scientists have a good deal of difficulty in focusing on them. They're not trained to uh, uh, focus on them. I mean, take a problem like the problem of universals, uh, whether uh, if two different things are, as we say, the same shape, mm -hmm. the same color, is there really something the same there? or is the same, just a façon de palais, and uh, not really to be taken seriously. Now, that does seem to be an important and genuine uh, problem. I completely reject the old Wittgensteinian Oxford idea that this isn't a real problem. It's a problem that's got to be solved, I think, and yet it is so abstract that it would be very difficult to get uh, the working scientist who has got all sorts of very much more concrete problems in view and good hopes of solving them, yeah. uh, uh, get him to focus on this sort of problem. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I suppose in the end, uh, uh, philosophy and science ought to be some use to each other, but uh, I don't really know whether philosophy can do a great deal more for science than uh, try and brush away some of the enemies of science. Well, you know, well, I guess the example that you that you cited um, is uh, is a particularly bad one from the point of view of, of uh, discovering, as it were, a collaborative enterprise. But I would have thought, um, in the area of mind, uh, for example, you've already talked yes. about. Um, self-scanning mechanisms. Uh, presumably, if there's <coughs> strong philosophical argumentation for the existence of, uh, of such a mechanism, that's a very strong claim, a claim that, uh, that scientists uh, could get working on. Uh, yeah, did you think that, um, that philosophers working in the area of philosophy of psychology or philosophy of mind uh, do have things to offer that psychologists ought to, to take seriously or, or perhaps um, should not neglect at their peril. Yes, I think perhaps they do, I think, uh, but I don't know whether my own particular work has been of the sort of detail that would be necessary to be of uh, much assistance to uh, mm. uh, psychologists. But yes, I do think that uh, uh, in philosophical psychology there ought to be uh, fruitful uh, collaboration and the sort of work that goes on in the States at the present time, the work of people like Jerry Fodor and so on, strikes me as work that is potentially valuable for, uh, uh, and shows prospect of uh, useful uh, interaction between philosophy and detailed concrete psychology. But uh, my own work, I don't think, has been to any very great extent uh, mm. of that sort. Yeah. It, it may appear surprising to, to some people that you seem to have taken a particular interest in uh, the, the philosopher George Berkeley, um, a philosopher with, uh, with views in many ways diametrically opposed to your own. Yes. I mean, Berkeley uh, is an idealist and an immaterialist, you're a realist and a materialist. What about yeah. Berkeley? Why is he in particular been of interest to you? Uh, well, uh, he writes extraordinarily clearly, yeah. and um, you always have the feeling with Berkeley that uh, you might actually be able to refute him, and uh, in refuting him, learn from him. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to some extent, my interest in Berkeley is a bit accidental. Uh, I, uh, for many years, in Me when I was lecturing at Melbourne University, I gave the first year honours course on Berkeley, and uh, I got interested in him uh, there. Uh, but uh, uh, surely it's important to uh, uh, 
have some appreciation of good opponents and uh, Barclay is a good opponent. I don't myself actually think he's one of the very greatest philosophers, uh, but he is a very great philosopher and uh, uh, you've always got the feeling with Barclay that uh, uh, you might be able to show exactly where he went wrong. Mm. Now that's a tremendous uh, compliment that you can pay any philosopher. Uh, uh, the compliment was paid to John Stuart Mill by a writer whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten who it was, but uh, he said that like other philosophers, uh, Mr. Mill made mistakes, but unlike many other philosophers, he wrote so clearly that he could be found out. Mm. Yeah. Yes, so it's it's Barclay's uh, it's Bar Barclay's clarity um, and refutability uh, that attracts you to him. But you you did say that you didn't regard Barclay as one of the the greatest philosophers. Which of the the classical philosophers, the great philosophers, has most influenced you personally? I don't know who's influenced me most personally, but I think of Plato as the greatest of the philosophers, and I have a lot of sympathy with uh, Whitehead's epigram of Western philosophy as a footnote to Plato. It's obviously exaggerated and mm -hmm. can't be true, uh, but uh, it's the sort of untruth that's valuable and stimulating, and I have a continual feeling that uh, Plato, mm -hmm. although it, of course my own views are very different from his, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that he set us the problems and set us ways of working on the problems uh, that I value most at any rate. Mm. Well, I'll, <coughs> I was trying to ask about your own intellectual development. So it wasn't so much a question of who you think is the, uh, uh, the greatest uh, philosopher, but who, which of the, the great philosophers have most influenced you, have most excited you? Well, Hume, when I was younger, mm. perhaps not so much now, mm. in a way he is a young man's philosopher. Uh, at the moment, uh, a philosopher who interests me very much is John Locke. Mm. Uh, Locke uh, uh, takes time to come to Locke, I think. Uh, Locke hasn't got the clarity and simplicity uh, and the straightforward drive that you find in Berkeley and in Hume. Uh, but I think he was a, a very wise man and uh, a very insightful man, though he has to be read more carefully than perhaps one can read philosophy when one's younger. Um, but uh, I think I have a pretty orthodox view, uh, you know, of, of uh, of who are the great philosophers, and uh, I find a little bit hard to say exactly who has influenced mm. me. In terms of personal influence, of course, I was very influenced by my teacher, John Anderson at Sydney. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you next, which, um, which, from which contemporary philosophers you, you learn most? Perhaps that's a, an easier question. Yes. Well, I think I, in a way, I learned a lot from Ryle. And I think I learned a lot from him in the sort of way I think he was like that. Uh, you could uh, you could get onto what he was saying and um, perhaps put a transformation onto it, which, uh, in my view, for instance, Ryle's philosophy of mind, the thing to do is turn it inside out, mm. and then you would get something like, or perhaps I should say, rather in view of Ryle's behaviorism, turn it outside in, and then you would get. Uh, somewhere near the truth. Mm. Well, uh, Jack Smart was a uh, been a tremendous influence on my materialism. Mm. Yeah. And but would you would you nominate those as the two principal influences on your on your di your own philosophical development? I don't know about that. Uh, we've talked a little bit about common sense. Uh, during this interview, and uh, G. E. Moore's defense of common sense, I think, over something enormously important. Yes. Uh, it's all a bit eclectic, as you can see. Uh, I've got a general empiricist, naturalist temper, and that's led me towards materialism. And uh, the uh, philosophers who've uh, helped 
to me in this way have been many and various, I think. Mm. I've been taken bits here and there, and uh, I, I can't say that I philosophize in the shadow of one, mm. of one philosopher. Y you give the impression of constructing over the years a, a systematic philosophy. Um, w would you say that the, that the, the structure is uh, cohesive, or are there certain parts now that you'd, uh, that you'd want to, to replace? Uh, I'm reasonably satisfied with uh, most uh, the things that I've done. Uh, the general drift. Mm. I've made all sorts of mistakes, of course. Any philosopher must make all sorts of mistakes, and I've tried to acknowledge them uh, where I can. I think I made a number of mistakes in my early work in perception, and tried to say uh, uh, where they're wrong, and, uh, where, where, what those mistakes are, as I now see it. Uh, but I rather doubt that all my views fall together in the sort of coherent whole, so that if you remove one, you remove the others. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of having a systematic uh, world view and uh, uh, a systematic philosophy, but the way my sort of uh, systematic philosophy has turned out, I think you could disagree m with me on individual issues and still go along with me on others. Uh, there was a whole series of choice points on the way uh, within a general empiricist naturalist temper. Mm. Um, you know to have strong views about the, the proper business of philosophy, if I can put it that way. Yes. Uh, the bifurcation of the departments at your own university is a uh, testimony to that, perhaps. Uh, which of the many roads that modern philosophy is now taking do you regard as definitely dead ends? Oh, well, uh, I, d I don't really uh, uh, regard uh, anything as definitely a dead end. Uh, I've got my own views and my own feelings as to where, uh, uh, where I work may most uh, profitably go ahead, but uh, I suppose what I'm most out of sympathy with is the wilder excesses of the uh, uh, continental tradition, particularly as it's practiced in Paris, mm. and uh, perhaps the Marxist tradition, uh, uh, while I think there may be very important matters here for sociologists and social theorists and political theorists, I'm not inclined to think that there's very much there philosophically. Yeah. What about um, things that go under the name of uh, philosophy, particularly in uh, in America? Things like uh, feminism and uh, environmental issues. Uh, these things are obviously very popular among students. Yes. Do these uh, do you regard these as intellectually demanding as uh, as a traditional philosophy? I don't think they are central to the philosophical tradition. Mm. It's clear you can bring a philosophical intelligence to bear. Mm. Uh, it does seem to me distressing that what people want to bring to bear on these fields of study is uh, commitment, mm. commitment to particular social views. Uh, while I think I have committed social views, I try not to let them get into my philosophy too much, mm -hmm. and I don't believe that they should. And I think to start out with the idea that uh, the point is to change the world rather than to understand it uh, is not a philosophical attitude. So to the extent that feminism starts with the idea that uh, this is an instrument for the liberation of women mm -hmm. rather than a uh, disinterested examination of uh, 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 of problems that come up uh, uh, in uh, in feminine studies, uh, to that extent, I'm out of sympathy with it. Yeah, um, Richard Hare once said that one could never be a good moral philosopher unless one were uh, morally committed, involved with uh, with moral problems. Um, you've never, to my knowledge, worked on ethics or, or social mm. philosophy. And do you regard these as unpromising areas of research? 
No, 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 I don't. But I've never been personally interested, and perhaps Hare's diagnosis is, fits me. Mm. Um, okay, a final question then, if, if I may. David, in what direction is Dion Armstrong's philosophy now headed? <laughs> oh, well, uh, uh, I'm really, uh, I started off in perception, and I moved from this to the philosophy of mind, and I'm afraid my philosophy, in a way, is getting more and more abstract. What I'm interested in now is fundamental metaphysical problems, mm. problems about the nature of universals, of law. I'm now working on questions of the nature of possibility, and uh, so uh, it uh, is uh, moving, I think, from the relative periphery to the very abstract center. Mm. Okay, well, perhaps that might be a good time to, uh, to terminate the interview. We can't get any more abstract uh, than we've got so far. So I'd like to, to thank Professor Armstrong uh, for, for giving us his time. It's been a, a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Lance.